district. Welcome to our town hall on making your vote count. For those of you who haven't been on one of these before, let me just share some of the general rules of the road with you. Many of you are watching live on Facebook and some of you have called in and are listening by phone. If you are on a phone, please remember to keep yourself on mute. This isn't a interactive uh, Zoom where you get to have live conversation with us. But there will be a chance to have Q&A at the end of uh, the presentations. People who are on Facebook will be able to write their questions into the Facebook um, app. And many of you have actually given us questions in advance. I always like to start off with a few announcements. I'm glad that you're able to join us. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy and wearing those masks and thinking hard whether you actually should go into the restaurants once they open, because there's still, still some real risks, even though we're all desperate to get out of our homes and have a nice meal that someone else cooked for us. The school opening situation here in New York City just keeps getting more confusing each and every day, and it changes each and every day. For, so for those of you who are students or who have children or household members in our public school system, I hope these opening days have not been too stressful. I know many of you began with half a day remote yesterday and then might have learned that today some of the rules of the road already changed. So there's a new opening schedule for New York City's public schools, which was announced, and it's as follows. On 921, 3K and pre-K will be open. On 929, K through 5 and K through 8 schools will be open. And on 10-1, middle schools and high schools will be open. At least that's what we know as of today. Always good to check every day. We're navigating a new way to be in school, whatever program you have chosen, hybrid or fully remote. We've been closely following the reopening of the schools and have made known my support for a state safe and healthy school environment with quality instruction. Look, that's everyone's goal. It's just not clear. We've figured out how to get that done yet. All right, it's September. So I'm going to holler at you one more time. You still have a chance to fill out your census forms if you haven't done it yet. I just can't emphasize enough those of you who've watched these town halls know that I'm a broken record. We need every single New York resident to fill out their census form. Even if they left the state for a while, even if they've gone to a country home for a while, you're a New York City resident, fill it out as a New York City resident. Please, it's actually urgent. It's a critical countdown time for our city, and my district in particular is in particular, is being undercounted because many of my constituents actually headed out of town for a number of months now. We could lose up to $3 billion in federal money and two seats in Congress if we don't get more New York City residents to respond to the census. There are people going door to door, perhaps in your building, you can still go online and fill out a census form. If we don't, it just means less money for our infrastructure, for our health care, for our desperately in need transportation system. So again, no one's allowed to have any excuse for not having filled out their census forms. And you've only got till September 30th. So if it's been sitting there on the table and you say, yeah, I'll get to it, or you've heard me say it again and again and again. If you're listening to me on Facebook, you know how to get on your computer and you can do it online as well. So no excuses. Our presenters tonight are from the League of Women Voters who will also talk about the census in case I didn't get through to you yet. Um, overview of this evening's event. Okay, so we have a really terrific group of people and we decided to put together this town hall about voting because frankly, my office has been inundated with calls about voting. 
it's I'm very gratified that so many of you are eager to cast your ballot but a tremendous amount of confusion remains about the process. So hopefully we can address most of the questions you have about voting tonight. The November 3rd election is the most consequential in generations and we must make every vote count. And we've made a number of changes to hopefully improve voting, but adding to the confusion because things are different. They're even different from the June primary. So our first presenter is Susan Lerner. She's the Executive Director of Common Cause New York. New York. Susan's going to provide us information about the recent changes to the state election laws, changes to the way New York City Board of Election is operating, and why it's critical to sign up to be a poll watcher or a poll monitor. After Susan's presentation, we'll hear from Susie Gomes, co-chair of the Voter Services Committee at the League of Women Voters, New York City, and Laura Quigg, volunteer and co-chair of the same Voter Services Committee from the League. And they're going to be talking about how you handle voter registration, if you still haven't gotten that done, the absentee ballots, early voting, and voting on Election Day. After the presentations, I will moderate a Q&A as I do each town hall, and we will be joined at that time by Liz Robbins, who's a counsel for the New York State Democratic Conference, um, working specifically for the election committee. And frankly, I just thought if some of you had more questions than I knew how to answer, I wanted backup from one of our counsels, who I know knows so much more than I do. That's why you have great staff, because that makes you look good. We have questions that were submitted in advance, and you can also submit questions through Facebook, as I mentioned. So now it's my pleasure to pass it over to Susan Lerner, the Executive Director of Common Cause. Hi, Susan. Hi, Liz. So happy to be here and to talk about my favorite topic, which is improving elections in New York, um, because that is actually what has happened in the intervening time since the June primary. I'm sure that the participants here remember the confusion around the June primary. Um, a lot of that was due to the fact that changes had to be made very, very quickly. So some people were frustrated uh, in delays and regarding uh, getting their absentee ballots. Others were frustrated in mailing them back and having them not be counted. And a lot of that had to do with just the very short time frame that was available to the Board of Elections to make a massive change because before the pandemic, fewer than 5%, generally 3 to 4% of New York voters voted absentee. And what we know from states across the country that have vote by mail systems, that have no fault absentee, that have 50, 60, 70% of their voters voting absentee or by mail, is that you need a robust infrastructure to push out a large number of ballots, get them back, check them, and count them. Um, and so the delays in counting the ballots were primarily regarding the fact that our law was set up for a very small volume of absentee ballots. So some changes have been made, which I think are going to improve the voting process and speed up the count. So I'm going to talk first about the changes that were made by the legislature when they came back in July uh, and looked at the situation around the primary and said, hey, there are some things that we can do. The first thing that was done was absolutely the basic reform that had to be passed, and that is ensuring that absentee balloting would be available to New York's voters in the general election. And they went one step better. They said absentee balloting will be available for New York's elect, uh, voters all the way through 2021. So what was done was to take up the governor's idea of expanding the definition of illness to include fear of getting sick or making somebody else sick and ensuring that that would apply for every election between now and December 31, 2021. That was important because the boards of elections needed time to prepare for a large number of absentee ballots. The other things that were done um, were to reinforce the process, uh, particularly the concerns that we had with an unusually large number of absentee ballots that ended up being invalidated 
after the June primary. So for the first time, we now have a procedure in our election law in New York that ballot, or there's a question of the match between your absentee ballot signature and the signature in the poll book, um, or you didn't put your absentee ballot back into what we call the privacy or oath affirmation envelope, that you get notification and an opportunity to cure that defect so that we should see a significantly lower number of ballots invalidated. There was an issue around postmarking of your return ballot. Um, an earlier change in our law allowed all of us to put our absentee ballots in the mail back to the board as late as the actual election day. Previously it had been the day before, so we simplified it. You vote, you have your vote in, you can mail it on election day. It has to be received within seven days after election day, but it has to have a postmark, which shows that it was mailed no later than end of the day election day. And what we found in June unexpectedly is that the post office does not always date stamp particularly a business reply envelope. So there were questions about absentee ballots which were received within the grace period but didn't have a postmark. So the legislature addressed that problem somewhat and said if the ballot, absentee ballot is received by the day after the election without a postmark, it still will be counted. So these are significant um, changes and reforms that are designed to really improve the process of absentee uh, voting and ensure that your vote is going to count. Uh, but there were still some additional fixes and the governor stepped in with an executive order. Um, and in his executive order, he simplified the process for curing defects in your absentee ballot further. Um, he ensured that all of us will receive an informational postcard that tells us things like the deadline for voter registration, the deadline for applying for your absentee ballot, and gives the kind of voter-specific information that voters in many other states are used to getting. So this is a very big first um, for New York, and I think a very positive uh, step in providing you with information in writing to help answer some of your questions. Um, and also set up of a reporting requirement for the boards of elections to let the governor know how are they doing with poll worker recruitment, how are they doing with staffing, because that is something which the state government can help with. If there's a shortfall in a county, then the state government can assign state workers to pick up the shortfall. Um, and there has been a really significant campaign to recruit people to be poll workers. There were some counties that did not have enough poll workers um, for the June primary, and that meant that some polling places were consolidated or closed. Um, I'm very happy to say that that seems to have been a um, successful effort. Not to say that we don't need more poll workers, but more people have applied to be poll workers. And if that is something which you are interested in doing, and particularly we're hoping for younger people to step up and be poll workers, then you go to uh, nyc.electiondayworker.com and you can apply. The Board of Elections has also made administrative changes that are going to help all of us and that are going to simplify the process and ensure a accurate and faster count. Um, as you're undoubtedly aware, you can, thanks to the change in the law and the governor, we are now able to apply for absentee ballots six different ways. The fastest and most effective way to apply is online. So nycabsentee.com, you fill out a short form and your application is immediately in the printout queue. Nothing else has to happen. But another lovely thing which has happened with the New York City absentee ballot application process that we've been advocating for for a while is that if you go to the Board of Elections website, right under the space where you click to apply for your absentee ballot, you now can track your absentee ballot. You can track it not only within the Board of Elections, so you can confirm they've received it, you can find out when they've mailed it to you, but you're also 
the board is also going to be able to track your absentee ballot through the mail. So let's say you go on the board's website, you get the six digit identifier that allows you to check and you find out, oh, my absentee ballot was mailed on October 1, but it's October 14th and I don't have my absentee ballot. The Board of Elections can check and see where in the mail it got stuck. You'll also be able to verify that the board has received your absentee ballot when you've sent it back, um, and you'll be able to find out if it was counted. Uh, another thing that I'm very happy we advocated for that the Board of Elections here in New York City has picked up is that there are going to be drop boxes for your absentee ballots at every single early voting location and election day location, as well as drop boxes at all five New York City Borough Board of Election offices. So if you get your absentee ballot and you decide for whatever reason that you don't want to mail it, and by the way, if it's close to the time, which is October 24th, when early voting starts or close to election day, I would advise you drop it off if you can at all. You won't have to stand in line. You won't have to talk to anybody. You won't have to sign in. But you will know that the board has received your absentee ballot before election day, and then you know it's in their hands, and you don't have to worry about the mail. The other thing that the New York City Board has done is that they have invested in high-speed ballot sorting equipment. So we're expecting that the time delay between Election Day and when they can start counting the absentee ballots will be substantially reduced. There also have been some modifications on the basis on which candidates can object to absentee ballots, because that slows down the process as well. And we want to be sure that every eligible voter, however they choose to vote, whether they vote early by mail or in person or on election day, has cast a secure ballot that is going to be counted. And all of these improvements, I think, are going to move us closer to that goal. Great. Thank you, Susan. That was terrific. And again, I just want to emphasize, as you did, there are many new changes. And if people got a little lost in anything you said, they are going to get material in the mail through the Board of Election. And if they, of course, need to call my office to get clarification, uh, as many people do every day, 212-490-9535. I now want to send, hand it over. Oh, yes, Susan. I did forget one thing. I apologize. Okay. And that is that there is another way in which you can get involved, and that is to join the Election Protection Program and become a nonpartisan poll monitor. We're recruiting bike riders to ride between uh, New York City polling places, and if you feel comfortable, we can also assign you to a specific polling place to help voters. And you do that by going to protectthevote.net and signing up. But most importantly, Make your choices early and be patient after election day. We're not going to know the results that night. That's right. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. And yes, I should highlight that Common Cause and the League of Women Voters are nonpartisan organizations. We want everyone to make sure they vote. I'm a little biased. I'm a Democrat. But everybody else involved here tonight is talking nonpartisan. Vote for whoever you please. I feel that way too. Let's just make sure you don't get thrown off or confused and you are able to vote and have your vote count. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Susie Gomes and Laura Quigg from the League of Women Voters. Hi, ladies. Take yourself off mute so we can hear you. I'll share the screen and Susie, take it away. And Susie needs to come off mute also. Still on mute, Susie. <laughs> there you go. Okay, thank you. My apologies. My internet, of course, crashed at just the wrong moment, so I am now doing this through my phone. And okay. it's um, technology is not my my first mission in life. So, um, thank you, everyone, for having me. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Kruger, for having us tonight. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the League of Women Voters, 
Um, I hope many of you are. If not, um, let me tell you just a tiny bit about us. We are a 100-year-old organization. Um, we started, we are 100 years old nationally in conjunction with the 19th, uh, signing of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. Um, of course, New York City being just sort of as wonderful as we are in New York City and awesome. Uh, we are ahead of the national um, anniversary and we are 102 years old this year because we are two years ahead of national and a year ahead of the state of New York. Um, our mission as we we have to find it in New York City. And New York City is, you know, just a, so different than New York State even. And certainly we are, we are such a representation of, the, of, of all of the country. Our mission uh, for the League of Women Voters, being that we are nonpartisan, is to just increase all New Yorkers' participation in local communities and government through education, the vote, and issue advocacy. So we are all about um, making um, all of New Yorkers more informed, more involved, and more aware of everything that goes on in their communities and wanting them to be involved in their communities and showing them how they can make a difference in their communities. We are nonpartisan, as Liz, uh, as Senator Kruger mentioned. Um, we are membership-based, and we are all volunteer. So every one of us um, just does it out of the out of the joy that we get from us. And um, we would love for all of you to join us. So if you're, we will get back to that later. Um, we are focused and on informed and active participation in government, and like I said, we are all about educating uh, every New Yorker to make more informed and, and stronger decisions for themselves and for their community. Uh, we try to influence, although we are nonpartisan, um, and we are certainly nonprofit. Uh, we do work to influence through public policy. Um, we do take stands on issues that we think are for the betterment of our communities and society. Um, and so we will work to try to advocate for those issues in Albany uh, when we think it will make a difference for our constituents here in New York. Um, and we are, well, we're celebrating 100 at the national level, but again, we're 102 in New York. So next slide, Laura. Okay. Um, as was discussed already, we are very committed to 2020, and we are very committed to 2021 that I'll touch on in just a second. Um, but in 2020, we have started, because we are all volunteer-based, uh, all of these different committees that we have um, come up. Some of them are ongoing, some of them are ad hoc. Uh, we started a new committee um, in the past two months called Telephone Information Services. Um, it's sort of like a telephone hotline um, that we have different volunteers taking different hours to get trained on questions that come in and they answer the phones uh, from their own homes. Um, the phones get routed to their phone and they answer the calls and the calls come in about absentee balloting and registration and polling place and we help the callers, if they have access to computers, on how to look up the information. If they don't have access to computers, uh, sometimes we print out a form and we will send it, mail it to the um, the caller, or we have the form and we will send it to the mailer, uh, or we will provide the information that they need. Um, it's been an extremely successful program. We are getting hundreds of calls a week. Um, so if you can't get through to Senator Kruger, please feel free to call us. We, were our, we, were, we are open 
9 to 5 every day, and we would be thrilled to help you with anything that you need. Uh, we are certainly focused on voter registration. Um, right now, voter registration, the deadline in the city is, and the state, is October 9th. So you need to have your registration in if you have not registered by October 9th. Um, Laura's going to take you through if you have not registered yet um, as a means to being able to get registered. Uh, through TurboVote is a new system that's been set up through the City Campaign Finance Board. Um, it, and right now is probably about the time that you need to get online um, with them. And it's sort of an almost online voter registration. You can't go all the way through unless you have a, uh, a driver's license. But if you don't have a driver's license, you can put in all of your information and either print out the form and mail it in or have they will print out the form and send it to you. You sign it and mail it in. And that's sort of as good as we're going to get right near now in New York City. Um, we are also focused on sharing information about the absentee balloting system and how the means that you go about getting one of them and Laura's going to take you through all of that. Uh, early voting, we are very, very much pushing as much as possible early voting. Um, absentee balloting has, as Susan just went through, has become so much more efficient um, and effective since June, um, so many things have been corrected in our system that when since the June primaries. But having said that, early voting is counted um, on election night. So your vote is in the system, in the machines. They are stored up and they are counted on election night. Early voting is for nine days before the election from October 24th through November 1st, um, they take that Monday, November 2nd off, and then election day is November 3rd. Um, and Laura will take you through all of the details of all of these things. I just want to tell you what we're doing in support of the election. Um, and finally, we are uh, promoting a, a large social media campaign for uh, Get Out the Vote. Um, and. Uh, we are in the midst of creating that social media campaign. We will be putting it on our own platforms. Uh, we will also be putting it out on many of the city BIDs, which are business uh, development uh, neighborhood groups that every individual in the city lives within one of these BIDs. And they have, many of them have committed to putting um, our information on their platforms. Uh, we have interns that are creating their own social media um, information in their own native languages to uh, put out to their own community, communities where they live. Um, we also have a large postcarding campaign going on. And we right now we have sent out 750 postcards. We are in the midst of uh, creating a new postcard that we will be generating and printing about 2,200 2, more postcards, if not more, um, and sending them out. So um, we're going to talk about how you can get involved. Laura, the next slide. Um, if you are interested in getting involved with um, anything to do with this election, you can, one of the first things you can do is volunteer to bring an absentee ballot um, in for a neighbor or friend that trusts you um, to a poll site if they cannot bring it themselves. Um, that, is, that is allowed. You can bring multiple um, absentee ballots. That is also allowed by law. Um, you can let us know and we will send out our information. I believe Wendy has it to share um, our, my email and you can get involved and help us with postcarding. We will send you a packet with 
the number of postcards that you would like to sign up to do. The postcards have all the information on them. All you will have to do is put the name and address and we will send you the list of names and addresses. It will also, the packet, have these stamps. All you will have to do is address them, stamp them, put one sentence of a um, individual handwritten note because that's important and send them off in the mail. Um, the social media that campaign that we're putting together, if you would like to um, put it on your Facebook or on any of the platforms you may be on, or if your kids or grandkids would like to be involved and put it on their platforms, we would love to share that with you. And in this kind of grassroots campaign, that's how it's going to go viral. So that's how you can get involved from our side. And I will now turn it over to Laura, who's going to give you all the details of everything I talked about. Um, actually, can I just ask for time? Should I take about five minutes or? Yes, if you could, is that okay? Okay, Great. yes, I can do that. All right, um, so uh, I'll skip through some slides here. Um, there are a lot of uh, resources that are going to go into the chat for uh, websites to go to. Um, uh, vote for one is useful for looking up the ballot. Um, the New York City Board of Elections is vote.nyc, and that's one-stop shopping for all sorts of things, including uh, finding out whether you're registered and applying for an absentee ballot, poll site locator. That's what it looks like, vote.nyc, uh, or that's what it looked like la last week. They're updating it um, pretty quickly, and it's looking pretty nice. Uh, the New York State is what admin is what determines the laws for the um, elections, whereas New York City administers the elections. Uh, so you should just be aware of that. Okay, so the starting point that you should just know about is to look up your registration. So before you can do anything about voting, you need to make sure that you are registered. Uh, so you may think you are, but we encourage people to look up their registration um, to make sure that they're at the current address and their current name um, and, um, and that it's all up to date. And if you are not uh, up to date, then you should go ahead and register to vote. Uh, the main online way is through the DMV, but the clock is really ticking away on that one. So we really think that if you're in a position to register now, you should go and use a paper form, which is available through the Board of Elections website or we can even send you uh, a, um, a registration form. Absentee voting, uh, Susan talked about this a lot. Um, the way that absentee voting works in New York State is that you need to apply for a ballot, you receive the ballot, and then you fill it out and you either, um, you either bring it to a Board of Elections website or a voting booth. So the ballots will be mailed out um, beginning uh, next week or this week, but that's beginning next week. Um, so go ahead and apply now. You can do it online or through the paper ballot. And then you have options as to where you, can, where and how you can return it. Um, you can return it using the mail, which um, if you're going to do that, do it quickly. You can also hand deliver it to a board of election in your borough or hand deliver it to a poll site in your borough or you can give it to a trusted source. So that's what Susie was talking about with like helping people uh, by being a trusted voice, taking their ballots um, to them. Uh, tracking, Susan talked about, this is what it looks like on the vote, the FBOE website. Also, she talked about the challenges. Um, early voting, uh, we recommend people use early voting as much as they can. Um, the poll sites are further away uh, so that's the main negative, but it is one way to get socially distanced voting. I voted early voting uh, last November and uh, at the primary, and it was pretty empty. It was really great that this passed the legislature last year. We were thrilled because now people have a lot less pressure on um, having to get to the poll site on the general election day. Now there's much more flexibility. Um, so I'm going to skip through. Uh, the main thing I would like to mention is that there is no such thing of, as voting twice in New York State. Uh, if you vote um, using 
a, um, here, I'll go back to that. If you vote using an absentee ballot, if you apply for an absentee ballot, that ballot is not actually counted until the, um, uh, all the in-person ballots are counted. So it is not possible to vote twice. And, uh, and, and it's actually stated on the New York State Board of Elections website. So um, I'll mention census uh, really quickly because this is a big initiative in Manhattan. We are so undercounted. And um, we at the League are actually working with the Manhattan Borough President's Office to, uh, to have an initiative to reach out to those um, people who have left town. And uh, so we're doing postcarding, uh, sending out to people who have left town, as well as a social media campaign. But, um, you know, cannot be understated how important this is. So that's what I have to say. Um, we can take questions then at the end. That's great. Thank you. Well, you covered so much material, the three of you, quickly. But I already have a few questions that have come in through um, Facebook, and I'll just start with them because I think Laura actually just said them, so I'll just almost repeat. So people will wonder, when will they get their absentee ballot? And we just learned they're going to start to mail them out September 18th. So even if you filed for your absentee ballot weeks ago, as I did online, you're not supposed to have gotten it yet. No reason to panic. Um, but you should start to see them in the mail you know, by next week if they start to mail them out on September 18th when the City Board of Elections said it intended to start to mail them out. Um, and you can fill it out and get it back all those different ways as quickly as possible. But again, as Laura just pointed out, they're not going to be opened or counted until after Election Day because we do want to make sure that you have the right to go and vote. So if you fill out an absentee ballot, somebody's going to tell me if I'm wrong here, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. If you fill out an that, oh, you know what? I didn't invite Liz Robbins to come on because we jumped to Q&A. So Liz Robbins, let's get you on board as well as an election lawyer with us. She'll figure, ah, there she is. is. Hi, Hi, Liz. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, so when you fill out that absentee and send it in, it's not going to get counted yet. And so somebody asked, what happens if you decide you do want to go to the poll site and actually vote the old fashioned way, but you already sent in your absentee ballot, how do we make sure you don't get counted twice? So is that a good Liz Robbins question? Or it's really, it, go ahead. Yes. No, it's all right, no, whoever. Unless you want to take that, Susan. So it's really, uh, there's a procedure. Um, we, we're one of the few states where you don't get arrested if you vote twice. Do not tell your family in New Jersey, oh, you can vote twice. But New York has a system. One of the reasons why we have to be patient after Election Day is that first, the boards of elections compile the list of everybody who has voted in person. They compare that to the list of the absentee ballots which they've received in their county. And if you sent in your absentee, in the same county, it's removed. They then check cross counties to be sure that you didn't send in your absentee ballot at your uh, second home in Dutchess County and uh, you also voted in person in New York City. So we have a series of administrative checks to be sure that your in-person vote is the vote that counts and your absentee ballot will then be invalidated. Right. And so just continuing on that, once you've gotten your absentee ballot and you've filled it out, Susan Lerner, can you still track whether it really got back to the Board of Election? Will they know, will they know that in that system that you talked about a little bit? Yes. Well, every absentee ballot is given a six-digit unique identifier in New York City. What's new this year is that we as voters are now able to obtain that identifier and use it to check the progress of our absentee ballots. Previously, the Board of Elections kept track inside the board, right? We got a receive, we received an absentee ballot request. Um, it's this number is the request. We've now mailed it out, and then we wait to see if it comes back. You, the voter, can track. 
And if it gets lost in the mail, you're able to alert the Board of Elections and have them track it down. And so, Susie, um, mm -hmm. when will they be counting these absentee ballots? Because apparently it's not till after Election Day. Is that right? It is not. Um, the, the law says that it is seven days after Election Day is when they start counting the absentee ballots. Now, Susan mentioned that things were getting better, but that's better compared to June. So, because June was a, somewhat of a fiasco, um, it is seven days after the election. And that gives them the seven day buffer to do all of that checking, cross checking, and cross cross checking that Susan talked about. Because there is the ability in New York to do change your mind and change your mind again, you know. Right. And not get arrested. Right. And Laura, you pointed out the pitch for early voting and why yes. it was such a great opportunity. And, you know, one of the things that I tell people, if you're concerned about making sure your ballot does get counted, even though it's not going to get counted till later, that a solution is go to the early voting because then you know absolutely for sure when you vote that day, that's your vote. It's being counted right then and there. Am I right? Absolutely, absolutely. I um, we we even say that if people have their absentee ballot in their hands, they can go to the early voting poll site and it, they can choose to vote in person if they're finding less of a crowd on that day. Got it. So a question came in online, and I don't know exactly the answer, so I'm hoping one of you do, and it's about if you're in the hospital or in a nursing home, is there anything special about how you make sure you have the right to vote? So if you are a patient in a hospital, you always and still do have the ability to vote by absentee, and you would mark that you have an illness and you need um, an absentee ballot. Um, and I think this person was also asking about if you have a permanent disability and on the absentee ballot application, there is actually a, uh, a distinction made between someone with a temporary illness and someone with permanent disability. And you would mark that and you're signing a sworn statement that that's true. And that's how the Board of Elections knows that you are someone that should get a recurring absentee ballot. Right. So, so for now and through next year, because we changed the law, everybody has the right to do absentee. But under yes. the traditional model in New York State, um, you can only be a guaranteed absentee ballot every time there's an election if you get the status of permanent um, need for absentee based on medical need or some other category. So you can check that off even though everybody's getting to use the absentee now. Under the right. expanded illness. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, if you're right. deciding to vote absentee due to COVID-related reasons, then you would check temporary illness on your absentee ballot application. But if you're someone who knows that every year after year you will, you know, be in a certain residence, need the absentee ballot, you would select a permanent um, disability box so that the Board of Elections knows. Right, and since yeah. this person who typed in, oh, go ahead, Susan. I don't and want to cut you off. check back later in 2021 because we are anticipating that we will have no fault absentee here in New mm -hmm. York in 2022, um, in which case a lot of these questions about what box you checked go away. Exactly. And they've made a lot of accommodations for COVID, which is why we all have the right to do absentee. And while they're being very conscientious about um, social distancing in voter sites and how, as Laura pointed out, the early voting sites are much less crowded. And since you can pick a Saturday or a Sunday if you go to work and you find work, you know, voting on a Tuesday so difficult. Um, but this person wanted to know whether we've made any other accommodations can you still have someone come with you to vote and help you? Um, they don't, we're not really booths anymore. They're more sort of tables where you go to to fill out your form. So someone can come with you, right? 
hold you up if you need a little holding up, help you with that. There's nobody stopping you from doing that today, right? Absolutely. You always have the right to have somebody assisting you of your own choice, so long as they are not your boss or your union representative. Probably not your elected official either. I think we are actually not <laughs> the election year in our polling sites. <laughs> we can vote ourselves, but otherwise we have to stay 100 feet away from the front and doors. some of your colleagues who you should share that information with, Liz. Okay, fine. Well, I'm just making, for the record, we can't do electioneering inside the polling sites. Um, so somebody asked whether the League of Women Voters provides all the same information and services in other states so that he can tell his college alumni program, you can get all this information wherever you live. Is that actually true, League? Yes. We had 700 leagues around the country, and the website would be lwv.org. And they can go on that website, and I'm not sure exactly where, but you put in what state, and within the state, it'll li list all of the different leagues around the state. And we are, every league is nonpartisan. Every league is all about getting out the vote, getting people registered, getting people involved with democracy. So a couple of you talked about using a trusted person to help. So let's say I'm a very friendly gal. Can I pick up the absentee ballots from all my neighbors, show up at a polling site and put 50 in a drop box? Do I need to get special permission or a note from the neighbor that goes with the envelope? Or no one's gonna stop me if I show up with 50 ballots and put them in the drop box? By, by, there is no law that states that there is a maximum, um, but you really should be that really trusted neighbor. Um, they should trust you and you should have a rapport. No one should give a ballot to someone that they don't know. Um, just because you seem trustworthy, they should make sure they do know you mm -hmm. um, and know that there's, there's no limit. There's no legal limit. And I'm assuming it's an absentee ballot, even though I'm handing it to someone to put in a drop box, it still has to go in an envelope that is closed with my signature on the back, right? That's absolutely. Yes. Okay. So you can't really walk around with loose ballots. They actually have to have been completed and signed and put in the envelope by the person. Mm -hmm. And another great question for whomever, can I drop these ballots off at any drop box? So let's say I live in Queens and I'm helping somebody from Queens, but my job's in Manhattan and the poll site is right next to my office in Manhattan. Can I take a Queens ballot and put it in a Manhattan poll site um, box? Uh, yes, you can. Um, it's, uh, it's a little better to take it within your county, which is within your borough. Um, but you you can take it to anywhere within New York City. Uh, it gets a little bit more far afield if they're trying to take it and drop it off in a board of election somewhere else in the state. But um, in that case, they should go into the board of election and like ask them. <laughs> but um, but but it's because that's getting to be a little bit risky. Uh, but but they can take it anywhere within New York City. See, and you just anticipated the next question. <laughs> if I am upstate New York and I got my absentee ballot at my country home and instead of mailing it in, can I just take it to that county's polling site and put it in a drop box? I'm, I'm, I'm getting a sense that's not a great idea. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. Our elections are run on a county basis. And yes. whatever county you've dropped it off at has a lot on their hands and just may not get to forwarding your absentee ballot on time. Okay. So I think this was a question. these questions were for Susan Lerner. Um, how am I gonna find out where my poll site is or where my early polling site is? 
So the New York City Board has not yet announced its early voting sites, but I am advised that they actually have added early voting sites, and we expect that they're going to be announcing the locations next week. Um, and you are able to look up your polling place on the New York City website. So it's nyc. It's vote.nyc. Another question that came in online, there were many votes not counted in the Democratic primary in our district, congressional races, um, and how are we avoiding the same problems in November? So you are absolutely right. It was terrifying to see in June that something like 21 to 25 percent of the ballots cast in the June primary um, were not counted for a variety of reasons, including they didn't get through the post office in time, they weren't postmarked, something else went wrong. So someone else's face has shown up on our screen. I'm <laughs> quite sure he's not Iris Wein Iris Weinshall, but people might know or not know that he is Mr. Iris Weinshall, it's otherwise true. known as US Senator Chuck Schumer. And we heard you might be paying us a visit, but we hadn't announced it in advance in case you couldn't join us. So I'm going to hold off on the Q&A now and introduce you. I don't know that you need much introduction. <laughs> we're talking about voting here tonight, Chuck. Yes, no, I know. That's why I was so eager to come in. And thank you for letting me, Liz, and thank you for the great job you're doing. We know each other. I knew Liz before she was a state senator, um, and we were good political comrades and allies then. It is true I am Mr. Iris Weinshaw. You should know that. <laughs> My wife is the COO of the New York Public Library and does an amazingly good job there. And uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a really important enterprise. So, so anyway, let me uh, say a few words about this. Uh, the 28th Senate District first is a great district and you are such active, strong people and yet you have a great active, strong state senator in Liz Kruger. Now, what is one of our top priorities? It's securing the election. Elections are the wellspring of, our, of America. And if we do not, if the American people don't believe the elections are on the level, it's the beginning of the end of our democracy. And that is really serious. Nothing is more fundamental. The amazing thing about America is for 200 years, people line up in quiet dignity at the polling place. They go inside, you know, they may be hungry, want to get home, sit in your chair and watch your favorite TV show, but people wait online in quiet dignity and do their duty. And then the next morning, we all, I'm sorry, got to call you back, Alex. This is my famous cell phone. I don't have, I am not a slave to an iPhone. I am not looking in my lap when I'm talking to you. Going bing, 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 bing. That's all I got. Anyway, um, uh, and the next morning, amazingly enough, we abide by the results. Donald Trump, in a pernicious, vicious, and egomaniacal way, is trying to ruin that. Why? So he can discombobulate our elections, he can breed distrust, and if he loses, which I believe he thinks he's very likely to lose, he can try to cast doubt on the honor and honesty of the election. Now, one thing I wanna say before I get into the substance here, this is for Liz, me, and all of you who are leaders. You know, we should not be messaging, oh, everything is screwed up. It will discourage people from voting. We have to be saying, no, the way to stop them from stealing elections is vote. The best way is to vote. And if Donald Trump loses by a large amount, even he won't be able to screw this thing up. So uh, we have to be really careful. And we are fighting him on so many different fronts. First, getting the money to the boards of elections. In the CARES Act, I fought hard and we got $400 million, which went to the states to help with the new circumstances. Many more people voting by mail. Uh, many people who don't vote by mail uh, would show up and there'd be difficulty because you'd need more polling places, more distancing, more PPE. Now, that wasn't enough. That was a first installation. Uh, we then, when we passed the CARES Act back in March, we thought, well, things might be better in November. But of course, they're not. So in the HEROES Act, which the House passed, uh, and your Congresswoman, Carolyn Maloney, played a lead role in helping pass, 
um, <clears throat> we added $3.6 billion to go to the boards of elections. I was just on the phone with a whole bunch of secretaries of state, Democrat and Republican. They need the money. They need the money to, because everyone who wants to vote by mail should be allowed to vote by mail. They need the money because if people want to vote in person, they should be able to. They need the money because many states... New York won't do it, I guess, um, will have drop-off boxes where you can actually drop your ballot off right nearby your home, and it's safe and secure, and you don't put it in the mail, and you don't worry, and it's picked up. They are doing drop-off boxes at the ballot sites, Senator, have- so they can go early. Right. Up to nine days in advance, they can go to any Board of Election office and drop off. Good. Well, I'm glad we put that, we do that in New York. Yes. Now. Uh, that's a big improvement. New York, by the way, has one of the most regressive election laws in the country. I know this because I ran, it was put in force not by Republicans, but by the old Democratic machine, which didn't want any challengers. I ran against that machine in 1974. I was one of the first to beat them. It was the anti, we were running on an anti Vietnam War slate, and the machine was alive with the mainstream Democratic Party, which and still. We know wanted. how busy you've been in Washington, but we changed a bunch of those laws between the June primary and now. You'd be right. very proud of us. That we is true. a lot of improvements in the laws. Good. And, you know, it's also very easy to disqualify a ballot in New York if you don't dot the I and cross the T. And we're the worst state of those. Did you change that one yet? I know you will. We've done some of it. We tried to do more. We have more to go. Good, good, okay. So first we're trying to get money for elections. Second thing we're doing is trying to straighten out the post office. Um, uh, When Mr. DeJoy was appointed, I had my suspicions because of who he was, that he was a Trump contributor, and because um, we saw what Trump wanted to do to the post office. Even before elections, he wanted to destroy it because, you know, the right wing doesn't like anything government. Let the private sector do it. You know, if you're a wealthy person in a big city, you can have your mail dropped off privately. You're a poor person, you can't afford it, or you're, if you live in a rural area, can't get it. We need the post office. I called DeJoy, DeJoy when he came postmaster. I'm the minority leader of the Senate. I called him three times, he wouldn't see me. What arrogance. And so when we had our negotiations, Nancy, uh, Speaker Pelosi, myself, um, uh, Mnuchin, and um, uh, Meadows, we said, no more negotiations till he shows up here. And we pummeled him, and the guy was just an awful man. He he didn't care about the post office. He had a swagger. Someone described him. He had a thug-like way about him. And um, we beat him up very badly. And we started a national campaign, how bad the post office was. And by the way, this was universal. Rural areas, which are Republican by and large, were very strongly against what the post office was doing. Everyone was getting late mail. The senior citizens who depend on mail for their drugs. You know, I, I, um, I take statins. It's not life and death. But when my pills are late and I only have two left in the bottle and then nothing has come in the mail, I get nervous. Well, you can imagine if it's a life and threat, you know, if a drug that it's like your life depends on it, how your life. And, and, you know, during COVID, people needed food and everything else. And I mean, he was dismantling the post office, both for election purposes and other. Well, we beat him up so hard that he reeled from the pressure. And in fact, we got the postal board to put an oversight over him, which they're supposed to led by one of my appointees, a Democrat named uh, Colonel Moak, and another Democrat who was involved in the um, uh, auto bailout, who's a very good guy and progressive. And they are beginning to straighten it out. There's still a lag in deliveries, but they're not as bad. They have agreed now that all mail elections, whether it's a request for an absentee ballot, an absentee ballot itself, will be treated as first class mail. They are trying to work with all of the um, states so that if there's a barcode, it's automatically counted and you don't have to get it postmarked, which you know often runs into trouble. Are they better? Yes, they're still not. They still haven't replaced all the machines they've dismantled and still haven't put all the post boxes in, but we did that. And so, we're trying to do that. We're also trying to look at what we can do to prevent um, uh, Trump, I said McConnell, birds of a feather, uh, from you know, screwing with the election afterwards. We have the best, one of the best election lawyers named Mark Elias. Now, in many states, we've won lawsuits that even if the ballot arrives two, three, four days late, it can be counted, that the count must go on. The good news is in, in many of the swing states, there is either a Democratic governor, Michigan, Pennsylvania, or um, uh, Wisconsin, 
And in a few other states like Florida and Arizona, there's an automatic pre-mail count, so Trump can't mess in. But there are states he can mess in, and we're doing lawsuits to try and make this work out as good as possible. So this is all very, very good. But we need some real oversight. Today, Senator Sanders, Bernie Sanders and I, sent a letter to create a special bipartisan committee, even number of Democrats and Republicans, to have hearings about how we can secure our elections, what the dangers are, and what we should do about them. McConnell may well reject it, but if he does, we're going to try to force that to happen um, in a very serious way. So we're doing everything we can at the federal level to ensure that these elections are fairly conducted and Trump can't mess around with them before, on the day of, and after. We're also, for those of you who might want to volunteer, we're recruiting 50,000 volunteers. You know, the Republicans are going to try to intimidate particularly poor people and people of color in the voting. And um, we're recruiting 50,000 lawyers. Every time they have someone there, we're going to have someone there who keeps them off. Every time when they count the absentee ballots afterwards, we're going to have someone each counting in every key precinct so they can't mess around. And I will get Liz the number if you want to volunteer for that activity. Some of it will be in person, but much of it will be virtual. So please do. So with that, let me thank you, Liz. I don't want to hold up your Q&A. Thank you for caring about this. Thank you for fighting the fight. Men and women have died through the centuries for our sacred right to vote. We cannot let Donald Trump destroy it. And together we must do to stop that. Thank you so much for taking a few minutes of your very busy life to join us and talk about this because... That's why we're all here tonight. There's nothing more important than ensuring that we have a legitimate election where everyone gets the right to, to vote and has their vote counted. So again, thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you, everybody. Senator Schumer. Let me thank the League and Common Cause and the other groups I don't have. Yes, I have the list in front of me here. Let me you thank the right. Cause, the League of Women Voters, and those are the two groups. So thank you. Yep. For being here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you. All right. So we were right in the middle of the question um, about ensuring. Sorry, I'm going right back to it. Um, back in June, there were a lot of problems with the primary. It's true, and votes weren't counted. And so I think if we walk through the steps that we we've, we've made since then, they were really intended. Um, to make sure that these same mistakes weren't going to happen. And again, one of the biggest ones was the board sent the ballots out too late in the game. People didn't get them in time, so they didn't get them back to, to the board in time. The post office didn't always postmark the envelopes, and our law talked about postmarks in our envelopes. So again, those, those ballots are going out starting next week, so it's weeks earlier than it was during the primary, much more time to get them back, many ways to get them back that we didn't have before, um, and even some different rules about what you have to do to fill in the ballot correctly or not correctly. What else should I have mentioned to make sure that we're not going to have the same mistakes? Susan, you want to say something? The envelopes, I forgot to mention. The envelopes have been redesigned so you can actually understand what you have to do. If you uh, had an absentee ballot in June, it was virtually impossible to find the signature line. You are really going to be stunned with how clear the new absentee ballot design is. There's a national civic engagement design entity that came in and worked with the Board of Elections pro bono. So we're expecting fewer mistakes. Thanks to the league and the legislature, there now is a cure procedure for the first time in New York. The league filed a lawsuit to be for, uh, because the state does not allow voters to come in and fix mistakes like not having your signature on the absentee ballot. And as a result, the legislature stepped up and took care of that problem. So if you forget to sign, if your signature doesn't look right, you forget to date your absentee ballot, or you forget to put the absentee ballot in the oath envelope, you can cure the defect. Thank you. So and of we're course, expecting, yeah. as we talked about, if you, if you think you did your absentee ballot wrong, you can still go and vote. 
at the site. You can vote early voting or you can vote on election day. So everybody just remember, even if you think, damn, I did that wrong, you have an opportunity to vote the other way in person um, and not even have to worry about what happened with my absentee ballot. So I really do think that we've made a lot of progress. All right, I want to, even though Chuck just talked about volunteering, are there still ways to become a poll worker? And how would we do that here in New York City? So it, you apply through nyc.electiondayworker.com online to be a poll worker and the board is still accepting applications and really eager to have uh, your application. And am I right that you can do the training online so they're not making you go to some office somewhere or you still have to well, go to an office? The training for people who have been poll workers in the past is going to be online. I think there may be an in-person component if you're a new poll worker because you really need to understand how to turn on the uh, voting equipment and how to close out at the end of the day to be sure that you have an accurate count. Laura, you look like you were going to say something about that. I, I signed up to be a poll worker for the first time, so I'm waiting for my training. <laughs> so that's all I was going to say. Yeah. And, and if I still true, oh yes, go ahead, Liz. Oh no, if I may, I was just going to say because there really is nationally um, a message. Definitely, you know, volunteer for a poll worker in New York. It is a job you get paid. So not only is it a public service, you will make money from serving as a poll worker. So just wanted to throw that out there that in New York, it is a job and you do get paid for it. So is it that's another bonus. Is it $200 a day? Is that right? I think you know it's not. Yeah, do I you know the current rate for election day? 400 uh, for election day. Oh. And, but the early voting is less because that's shorter days. And they also pay you to do the training, I believe. Yeah. Yes. But I believe you don't get I believe you don't get paid until after election day. Right. They want to make sure that you show up on election day. Right. And for those of you just who don't know this, your commitment on election day is you get there before 6 a.m. in the morning and they don't close until 9 p.m. So you're probably there till 10 o'clock at night. So bring snacks and food for yourself because it's a long day. But I'm glad to hear that, God, I thought it was $200 a day, $400 a day, um, did, you know. It's what I, thought it was. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And what about if you want to volunteer? I know the league talked about um, volunteer options. Are there other places that people can reach out to, to volunteer before there's, or during? There's the National Election Protection uh, program which places nonpartisan monitors at polling places here in New York City, and we're going to be uh, placing uh, monitors in six congressional districts outside of New York City. And you have the option to be a roving monitor by bike or by car if you're not comfortable with being assigned to stay at a polling place and deal with a, a larger volume of voters, or to be an in-person poll monitor. Uh, and you go to protectthevote.net to sign up. And when you put your New York address in, it takes you to the page that's specific for the volunteer roles for New York, and we'll be getting your information and be in touch with you. And Susan, does that group also help to try to monitor and oversee what's going on? And might it play a role in something if things are going wrong? Absolutely. There are two ways in which we do that. Election Protection runs the 1-866-R-VOTE hotline. Um, and that is a hotline that is staffed by legal personnel um, in advance of the election and on election day to answer questions and to escalate problems. The nonpartisan poll monitors report back to our state control center and we then are able to alert the Board of Elections in the locale um, to the specific problem and try and get it solved. So a question came in referencing an article in the New York Times today and is asking me, and I'm afraid I didn't read the article yet, um, what do you think of a bipartisan, nonpartisan federal commission 
to monitor the elections in all the states as was suggested in this Times article. Did anybody get to read that? And have I an opinion have not actually read that yet. Um, but then also, wasn't that what Senator Schumer was talking? Well, I think he was, but I, he, I was going to ask him, but he popped off, um, <laughs> so I didn't have a chance to. So is it realistic to imagine a, a national monitoring commission this close to the election? Maybe. You know, we'll, we'll all read the Times article. Um, Liz Robbins has already found it for me, but I'm not sure I can read the New York Times while I'm running a town hall. It's a little... A right. little multitasking challenge. Yeah. So whoever wrote the question in, we'll get back to you later because we know who you are. So we'll try to make sure we get back to you after I've read the paper. But there are so many groups. If you almost just type into um, Google on your computer about participating in this election, I don't think there's ever been as much activity out there about ways that you can participate. And of course, we're primarily talking nonpartisan on tonight's um, video, although clearly Chuck Schumer was not being nonpartisan, and that's fine. Um, but you can also get involved with specific campaigns um, mm -hmm. because almost everything is being done while, while you can sit in your house at this point. You know, People used to actually get up and go door to door to campaign. They used to go to train stations in the morning um, and in school buildings when the kids were being dropped off. But to participate in this most important civic activity, you don't even have to necessarily leave your home at this point. So we do want to make sure that people know there are endless ways to get involved in the selection cycle, and it is definitely not too late to do so. I'm going to just go back There's quick. Yes? I was just going to yeah. say, um, Senator, there's many, if you Google, there's many postcarding opportunities. Um, they require you, I, I, I've done them, and I, I, unfortunately, I can't think of their name. Um, they text you, um, you sign up, and they text you if you're interested, and they'll send you a list of names and addresses. You need to get your own postcards and stamps. And then you write the postcards and you mail them out. Um, and it's as simple as just getting the list of names. And they're usually out of state. They're not in New York necessarily. They're for um, races around the country, depending on where they think it is. Um, if you are speaking specifically to your constituents who are on this call, there is... Um, Flippable.com mm -hmm. and Flippable.com is um, an organization that looks to flip red to blue, um, and they may have information. I am a nonpartisan league member, but I am just imparting information. That's okay, and there are many groups around the country. So if you are, say, passionate about environmental issues. Um, and that's what drives your concern about elections. I know that the National League of Conservation Voters is doing active voter participation efforts. If you're concerned about public education, there are groups working on that issue. You can almost type in the issue that gets you up in the morning and keeps you up at night, and then say that issue and the word voting and type it into Google together, and you are going to come up with any number of organizations who are doing something involved with this election cycle relating to the issues that are near and dear to you. Um, so I absolutely find it fascinating how the internet has allowed so many new ways for us to participate, um, so many new ways for us to make sure that we are able to register to vote and to vote right here in our city. Well, I've gone through the questions that we got, and so I think I am actually going to thank you all profusely for your participation here tonight. I'm going to let everyone know that we are going to have 
Our next event will be a little different. We've been doing these town hall model programs almost every week. Um, but in fact, what we're going to try starting soon is a new way to provide our senior resource fair. So historically, for 13 years in a row, I have hosted the largest senior resource fair, I don't know about it in the world, but definitely in New York City, um, where we get on any given day, well, the specific day of the year, we get something like a thousand people in one place, seniors, boomers, organizations that provide services to seniors and boomers, and we take over historically the basement of Temple Emmanuel, which is like a full city block. And we have this amazing event. It's not realistic that we do that this year. So we are going to experiment by having a virtual annual senior resource fair. And we're spreading it over three days, October 2nd from 2 to 3.30 in the afternoon will be the first day. And then October 13th and then October uh, 14th, 15th. No, sorry, October, excuse me, let's try that again. Three days in October, 13th, 14th, 15th, from 2 to 3.30, and each day will be different. So on the 13th, we will share resources on arts and cultural events, even when you can't go to them in, in person. On the 14th, we'll be discussing exercise and meditation options. And on the 15th, we're gonna continue our partnership with the Science Industry and Business Library and have a presentation on job searching for people over age 50. We expect to have our next virtual town hall sometime before that three-day senior resource fair. So if you found us tonight, you're on some list and we will make sure you get information as soon as that next event is scheduled. I want to thank Laura, Susan, Susie, Liz, and U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer for all joining us tonight and helping us all understand how we can and must vote. And by the way, something that didn't get mentioned tonight, but I want to before we end, we have to make sure people 18 to 25 vote. They have lower voter participation than older populations. It is critical that we educate our children, our grandchildren, the nice kid next door who's helping with the groceries, everyone. We need to make it so important to them that they understand why if they don't vote, government doesn't have to care about them. We want government to care about everyone, which means getting everyone involved in voting. So please think about the 18 to 25 year olds you know and do an extra pitch about their registering to vote before October 9th and then you can hit them up with the actual voting after that um, starting in the next week. So stay well, stay safe, wear a face mask over your nose and your mouth, keeps you safe, keeps others safe, and again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Bye.